Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from lunchtimemoviereview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. Welcome back to another episode of Lunchtime Movie Review, the podcast where we look back at some of our childhood favorites and see if they stand the test of time. I'm Chris. I'm Greg. I'm Patrick. G'day, I'm Shane A. And today we are reviewing part two of a film and book duology. Man in of the Spring is the conclusion, the exciting conclusion to Jean de Florette, which stars, I'm not going to say these names right, <laughs> Yves Montan, Emmanuel Bert, and Daniel Etoul. Greg, how close did I get? Very close. Very good. Uh, a twee. It's a, 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 Daniel a twee. That's you, you just about hit it right on the spot. Um, but before we begin butchering more names, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Ancestry DNA, the world's largest consumer DNA database. Everyone has a unique family history, and with a simple DNA test, intriguing facts, and family secrets can be revealed. Ancestry DNA can save you from a lot of heartache. With results so accurate, we'll bet the farm on it. So don't leave yourself hanging. Get tested before it's too late. Who the heck has the summary for today's review? I do. Greg, let us have it. The story picks up where Jean de Florette left off, although several years have passed. Uh, Jean's widow has now joined a glamorous opera touring company, but her daughter Manon yearns for the simple life in the country, and so she returns uh, to... Uh, live near the farm that was once her father's and placed in the care of a elderly couple of hobo mountain folk. <laughs> Meno ekes out an existence by herding goats and trapping bunnies and birds. In contrast to Meno's uh, simple, albeit somewhat impoverished life, the Subairons, the villains of Jean de Florette, are enjoying the fruits of their crime against Manon's father. Cesar and his nephew, Ugolin, are adding to the family's fortune with a successful carnation business, made possible by the water from the spring Cesar and Ugolin swindled from Jean de Florette. We soon learn that on a, a glorious sunny afternoon in Provence, God's bounty that Ugolin is not only a crook and a thief, but a pervert. He spies on Manon bathing nude in a mountain pond, followed by an interpretive nude dance accompanied by her harmonica. Ugolin is hooked, uh, who wouldn't be? And he is determined to make Manon his wife. In spite of their family's prosperity, all is not well with the Subairons. Cesar, the patriarch of the family, is worried. His nephew, Ugolin, is the last parent living, Subaron, and thus heir to Cesar's estate. Cesar wants his nephew to get married and have a son or daughter to carry on the Subaron line. And Ugolin tells his father not to worry, that he's found the perfect woman. And after briefly keeping her identity a secret, he reveals that she is, in fact, Manon daughter of Jean de Florette. Ugolin also reveals that he has competition for Manon's affection. Bernard, it's always a Bernard in French movies, a handsome school teacher new to the village who has seemed to attract Manon's interest. Cesar comforts his nephew by giving him advice on how he should court his newfound love. He suggests the old French hillbilly pickup line. Uh, fancy meeting you here whilst I was out shooting birdies. And so Ugolin dresses in his finest gentleman's hunting attire and begins his courtship of Manon. However, Ugolin does not possess his uncle's stately charm and stoicism. Rather, when Ugolin confronts Manon, he confesses his love to her and in the spirit of the great French poets like Cyrano de Bergerac, he resorts to offering to buy 
I know his affection, as if she were a gutter snipe whore from Marseille. <laughs> Manel turns <laughs> and runs for the hills. Undaunted, Ugalon pursues her. He then goes to plan B. He yells his confession that he has spied on her repeatedly while she was bathing nude. And he confesses that he came very close to raping her. Apparently, this is not the way to woo a French goat herding lass. <laughs> Memo flees to the mountains, the safety of the mountains. Ugalon is left alone where he discovers Manon's hair ribbon in the dirt. He picks it up with great care and reverence. Not content with the moderately creepy act of smelling the ribbon, Ugalon goes home and channels his inner Vincent van Gogh takes out a sewing needle and thread and stitches the ribbon into his skin over his breast. That's not very sanitary. No. Obsession is not a good thing. Mm -mm. Meanwhile, Manon, in the safety of her mountain retreat, overhears two villagers out on a hunt discussing her father's tragic demise, which Manon, as, as we found it towards the end of Jean de Florette, witnessed. Manon now learns that many fellow, many of her fellow villagers were aware of the Suberon's scheme, but they remained silent, largely because Jean was an outsider and a hunchback. Manon is overcome with anguish and rage. Later, while after a half-baked attempt at arson, in a thunderstorm, she, while looking for one of her lost goats, she finds the underground source of the spring that supplies water to the village, including the local farms. Taking a page out of the, so, uh, the Subeiron's playbook, Menno blocks the flow of the water using clay and large rocks. Thus, Menno has acted in revenge against the people that caused her and her family so much harm. The water supply for the village dries up. The villagers panic. There's civil unrest. The farms, the local farms, including Ugalon's substantial carnation crop, are in danger. The villagers come to believe, at least many villagers come to believe, that the sudden stoppage of water is God's punishment for the injustice committed against Jean. At a gathering, Manon publicly accuses César and Ugalon of their crime. A number of villagers admit their own complicity by having been silent. Another eyewitness to the crime comes forward and corroborates Manon's account. He, too, saw César and Ugalon block the source of the spring that Jean tried so desperately to find. Now Ugalon thinks that this is the perfect moment to propose marriage to Manon. Timing is everything. But Manon rejects him, complete with spittle, and the Suberons depart in disgrace. Rejected by Manon, Ugalon, suffering sorrows of Jan Werther, takes his own life by hanging himself from a tree. The last apparent heir to the Suberon fortune has died, and he has committed a mortal sin in the process one which the villagers are willing to keep silent from the local priest. On the brink of ruin from the absence of water, the villagers beseech Manon to take part in a religious procession led by the local priest to the village fountain, hoping that this act of contrition by the village will be answered by God with the restoration of the flow of water. Enter Bernard, the handsome, smooth school teacher. He takes a moment to speak privately with Manon, uh, to appeal to her. Perhaps he suspects that she may know the reason for the water stoppage. In any event, Manon reveals his, her secret to him, and together they unblock the spring. The water resumes flowing at the very moment the procession reaches the village fountain. Manon and Bernard are married, and Manon becomes pregnant, although not necessarily in that order. 
Meanwhile, Cesar is a broken old man. He grieves for the loss of his nephew and feels guilt for it. And he ponders the future of his his state, which is tied completely to the land that he loves, with no heir to give it to. Delphine, an old friend of Cesar, now blind, returns to the village after a long absence and informs Cesar that Florette, his long-lost love from many years before, had written a letter to him to tell him that she was pregnant with his child. As it turns out, Cesar never received this letter, as he was in the army stationed in Africa at the time. Delphine goes on to inform Cesar that Florette, having received no reply from Cesar, tried to unsuccessfully abort her baby, left the village, and married a blacksmith later giving birth to Cesar's child, who was born a hunchback. Cesar now realizes that his actions led uh, to the death of his only son and rightful heir to the Subeiron's fortune. Cesar knows that Menon is his granddaughter, and she is carrying a child who will continue the line of the Subeiron family. But Cesar is unable to speak to Menon and ask for her forgiveness. We don't know why we're left to imagine. He confesses to a priest and then makes preparation for his death as he tells the priest he has no reason to live any longer. He dies in his sleep clutching Manon's hair ribbon. We discover that he wrote in a letter before dying, bequeathing his estate to Manon, recognizing she is his granddaughter and the last of the Subeirons. And that's Menno of the Spring. It's one of our funniest summaries in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, you got any movie stats on this one? Yes, I do. Uh, Menon of the Spring was released November 5th of 1987, a mere about five months after uh, Jean de Florette was released in the United States. It was released the same week as Less Than Zero, uh, Shane's favorite film, Hello Again, Hiding Out, and Death Wish <laughs> 4, The Crackdown. Same, it was released the same month as The Running Man, Three Men and a Baby, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and Teen Wolf 2. Grossed just shy of $4 million at $3.9 million. It was the 121st highest grossing film of 1987, right behind such classics as American Ninja 2, Hot Pursuit, and Best Seller, and right in front of My Demon Lover, North Shore, probably one of Shane's favorite films, and The Monster Squad. Uh, was number four on Gene Siskel's best films in 1987, uh, which is ironic since Jean de Florette was also released in 1987. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 80% critics and 93% audience. So, And that is the kind of biographical on Manuel of the Spring. So if memory serves me correctly, a little bit lesser liked, but still very well revered. Um, Greg, this is part two of a film that you really like. Uh, what are your first thoughts on it? I really enjoy the film. I, um, I, I know Patrick expressed when we in our review of Jean de Florette that he preferred uh, Jean de Florette, and I, I have to agree with him. But that's not a, a real criticism of Manon. It's it's a it, it's a film that stands on its own and. Is very well done, uh, um, but uh, again, it, it, since it's the same director, a reprise of, of many of the same actors, uh, it's uh, it's beautifully filmed and a, a very very compelling story. A, again, very much a, a morality play, and we can touch upon some of the themes uh, that that it expressed, but. Uh, but yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. Patrick, now, I, now, as much as you know, Greg kind of hinted that I did not enjoy it as, as much as Jean de Florida. I, I didn't, but I don't think it's a bad film. It's still a very, very good film. I enjoy watching it. Uh, I, I just think that it has less, although there's a little bit more melodrama in it and a little bit more of a intricate storyline that. It causes almost this that you, it, to a certain aspect, to a certain perception, you you don't see it coming. Is that the Jean de Florette happens to be the son of 
uh, essentially the villain of the piece, and uh, he gets mm-hmm. his come up and spy realizing that he's killed his, you know, he was involved in the death of his own son. Not that, not that he intended to kill him or wanted him to die, but that what his actions caused him to be killed and that his granddaughter who will soon have his great grandchild uh, is, you know, does not want anything to do with him. And right. th- th- that kind of comes out of left field, you know, in the third act of the film and or the final act of the film. And it just kind of, it's, it, it, it's, it's not as satisfying. It doesn't flow as evenly or as naturally as Jean de Florette. Jean de Florette is a just much more self-contained story. It, it has a, a definitive beginning, middle and end where this seems to have starts and stops of various different plot lines of, you know, revenge and obsession and love and come up and so that it doesn't flow quite as easily, but still very, very good. I mean, it shot basically right after the first one was done. So you have the same visual style, same direct, same director, uh, a lot of the, some of the same actors coming back to reprise their roles, uh, you know, just, uh, and supposedly much older, but I, I like the film, but I don't want to give the impression. I don't like it. I just don't like it as much as Jean de Florette. Shane. Well, you're right, Patrick. It doesn't flow as easily as the uh, crystal clear spring water of the first film. Um, It's another excuse, uh, another exercise in really good, you know, top filmmaking, superb. Uh, The vibe was darker, which made me a little bit depressed watching it, uh, leading to another terrific ending. Uh, I did not see that one coming at all, and I totally forgot it from seeing it many years ago. So that helped with my surprise towards the end of this. Just didn't see where it was going. Um, but that said, I kind of do like Jean de Florette better. Uh, although this one could well stand alone rather than like as a singular film, rather than be a sequel. It's It, ta- it has different tangents. And although it's a great film, acting and everything about it, I totally enjoy it's, almost an opposite film to the first one, um, which didn't make it any worse or better. It just made it different, but still captivating. Um, Terrific, terrific terrific film. You know, I'll echo that myself. But um, because uh, we saw The Godfather 3 recently, and that's fresh in my mind, uh, I kind of felt about this film the same way I felt about Godfather 3, is it's more of an epilogue kind of the main story's already been told in the previous film, and this is just kind of what happens after. So it's not necessarily as solid of a, solid of a story, although it's still very a very good film. Um, man, um, Emmanuel Bayard it was definitely much better than Sofia Coppola. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's got that for it. But uh, I did, you know, because wow. that film is so fresh in my mind, I did see kind of a parallel to these two films in in kind of, the the story's tone and themes. Well, let's be clear that my my beagle is uh, uh, much better than Sofia Coppola in acting. Yes. <laughs> so. Well, that's true. So let's talk about some actors here. It's pretty much the same. Or I'm sorry, Shane, did you, uh, I cut you off on something? Oh, I was actually going to go go into. Um... I wasn't going to bring up Sophia, but Emmanuel <laughs> Bart, is that how you say her name? She, yeah, yeah. She's, she's great. And, and from the moment you first see her on the screen, it's sort of like the same time you, you last see her on the screen um, as a little girl. She's like staring through the, although she's in the tree, but she's still sitting right. and staring and looking. And I like that contrast. I think it was a good way to introduce her into this one especially since I'm sure a lot of people who saw Jean de Florette uh, probably saw this one. Um, is it, is she contractually obligated to get uh, naked at some point in a movie, by the way? I'm not that I'm complaining, but uh, she likes to, the actress does like to get naked in a film. What? Uh, okay. I, the only other film I looked at her filmography and the only other film that I'd seen her in was mission impossible. And she did not get naked in that. So Oh, I, I don't think Tom Cruise likes the ladies to get naked in his films. Um, some more French films. I'm trying to think of the the names offhand. There was one where she was uh, kind of a muse for an artist. Uh, what the heck was that film called? She's a French actress. Uh, Come on. What do you expect? Yeah. 
in the early 90s, I saw her in a movie. She was a violinist in A Heart of Winter, which also has Daniel Ote in it as well. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I said his name right. Uh, but she was an American. After this, she came over to the US and did Date with an Angel. She was the angel in an American comedy, like a teen comedy uh, as well. So, I remember that. And she's film. still acting now. Well, that one had Phoebe Cates. So if you give me a choice of who's going to go topless in a film, I think I might give it to Phoebe. Phoebe was in Drop Dead Fred. <laughs> she did not get along topless those, in there. Along those same lines, I... You know, I, I don't have any problem suspending my disbelief in, in films, whether they're uh, filmed in a, a realistic style or, you know, completely you know, fantasy style, but... You know, there are certain times when I draw the line, like, ah, you went too far, director. And I, I just think Emmanuel Bear as a goat herder is <laughs> one of those lines. But, you know, it, it wasn't believable for you. Yeah, but she, uh, you know, she had to be beautiful. I mean, I, that, that's, that's obviously a critical part of, of the story. But um, I don't think there are any goat herders in, in uh, Provence that look like Emmanuel Bear. <laughs> I'm just going, going out on a limb there and saying that. Well, I think that's a pretty sturdy limb that you're going out on there. So it's... <laughs> she gives a very good performance in, in this film. I, you know, I, and what's interesting is that even though she's the, the title character, it's not so much about her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's 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 a, it's an epilogue, as as Chris said, of 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 Eve Montan's, you know, Cesar's tragedy. Um. You know, She's the MacGuffin in this one. I yeah. Guess. Now let's talk about how do you say his name? Ugolin? How do Yeah, Ugolin, yeah. I thought he's pretty creepy in Jean de Florette, but he went over the top in this one. <laughs> but yes, he did. I think towards the end I actually legitimately felt sorry for him um being rejected. I mean, in some he wasn't really the the nicest of characters, but in some ways he is a sympathetic character in this film. I will say that I, it, it's a reflection on, on the actor's skill, but also on the director, that he makes Cesar and Ugolin, he makes you know, them sympathetic characters. And that's hard to do, <laughs> given, you know, given their, their histories. So I, I agree with you. I, I mean, and look, there, there are things we don't, we're never told. We know that that Ugolin served in World War One, and we don't know what he experienced there that may have, you know, affected the, his his view on life. And um, well, the French did horribly in World War One, and it, it it's a huge effect, I think, even to this day on them. So I could see that that affected him majorly. You know, and and so I mean, there's and and living in a, in a town that small. You know, I would imagine that it's easy to go stir crazy and you see someone. And and the thing is, he has to know, he has to know, given uh, that he's never going to win Menno over be, just because of. Even if he isn't aware of of how much Menno knows, just the fact <laughs> the way they acquired uh, his his her father's farm, uh, he has to know there's no way he's going to win her affection. So it's kind of the, impo you know, she's, she's impossible. And I think that just adds to his torment, but yeah, it's very, very good performance. Yeah. Very, he, it, it, it would have been very, a, a much less skilled actor would have taken that, you know, that, that role too far um, to the point where he wasn't believable, but he was in this entirely so well done i i totally agree with greg he was he took it over the top but still believable and he was creepy i thought he was creepy yeah. he was he was sniffing that ribbon mm -hmm. i'm like is this is this the same movie is, what am i watching here and then when he started <laughs> stitching it into his nipple mm -hmm. I, um, it creeped me out it was horrendous but his acting was great. And later on in his career, he's turned into like a, a leading man, a good looking sex symbol almost in French films. So they've really played it up, his role in this. But I can't say I felt 
sympathetic towards him at all, in a sense. I mean, no one you don't, no one likes seeing someone hang himself in a movie. Or no. Anything, but it's just, and it, I and didn't he, feel sympathetic for him. He he view, he thinks he's ugly. I mean, he expresses that to his uncle. I'm ugly. She, yeah. He, he wants, and he's not. <laughs> you know, he's not. <laughs> so he's... His character is a is a hot mess, and so you know, uh, yeah, you do. Well, you brought up you brought up a good point that you don't know what it was never really fully explained what he went through in the war, and any war is going to trouble mm-hmm. someone. So he, yeah, he's come back with that in a history, so that obviously had something to do with it. But yeah, um, he's not ugly. No, he just needed a bit of a touch up. <laughs> and I'm sure he didn't have a whole lot of choice in that small town. Right. <laughs> nah, he was just fucking creepy. That's all. <laughs> he, play, he plays it very well. No, he, he yeah. plays it very well. And, and, yeah. And, and I'll agree with Shane that I don't find sympathy towards any, either one of the characters because of what they've done. And by the, you know, by the end of the film, I, it, it seems like the filmmakers are going out of their way trying to create sympathy. And I can't, as a viewer, I can't forgive what they did that caused the death of Jean in the first film. And I can't, you know, exp- I, I, I can understand Magnon not wanting to forgive them for what they've done. And that, and that's where my entry into the film is, is through her perception of the, those characters. And they, they can't be redeemed. And the only thing they can do is they can get their come up with some sort of, you know, for, for him to hang himself, I didn't think he had to go to that extreme. The fact that his love would never be returned, I thought would have been punishment enough. That they that that he died was more of a punishment for the uh, the for the the uncle character, um, and the, yeah, and th- that is why you know that's that's his comeuppance in that. Yeah, and that and that segues. I mean, it's it's a recurring theme throughout the movie. The the juxtaposition or the conflict between the desire to seek revenge and then the, you know, the Christian uh, philosophy of forgiveness. And that's, that, that theme carries through this film. I mean, it, it's, it's, and what's interesting is, yeah, does Mano ever forgive? No. Forgive? Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't she, think does. she does. No, I mean, she, she unblocks, she unblocks, you know, she went after talking with Bernard, they, they unblock the source of the spring, but that could be just simply because that's for the rest of the town, the rest of the village that she doesn't find uh, as complicit as of course, Ulan and, and, and Cesar. But I don't know that she, I don't think she ever forgives Cesar. And of course, Cesar never goes to her to ask for her forgiveness. He can't do it. And why is it, is it pride? Is it fear of rejection? Is it um, that, is it perhaps that he doesn't want to impose himself on her because any more than he already has, you know, um, does he, does he prefer to die not seeking her forgiveness? He confesses to the priest, but that's, that's very, that's a very important thing in, in Roman Catholicism, even someone who may not be that religious. Um, but he never confesses to the person that, that, you know, had to live with the consequences of his actions. And so I don't know. I, I think that's, I, I like that about this film. I, I like the fact that there were a lot of, you know, recurring themes that that were very well dealt with, and that made up for some of the other shortcomings that that you all have have pointed to when you compare this to Jean de Florette. I think that for Menon, uh, her revenge with the uh, with the blocking up the spring was definitely for the town, uh, and her revenge for. Uglin yeah. was was rejecting him, and her revenge for Cesar was was Uglin's death. So she might not have forgiven him, but I think she, at the end of this film, she got her revenge on everybody, and it looks like she moved on to a happy life as she was pregnant. Although you could, that baby could end up being like Kylo Ren in well, the, well, in their well sequel. Sh- sh- sure. And the other thing too is she expresses very early with, uh, you know, her her surrogate parents, you know, the, her caretakers that she has a real problem being around her father's farm. You yeah. Know, too, many, too many bad memories or whatever she says, you know, something mm-hmm. to, to that extent. And now she's inherited it. So, I mean, is she, 
what is she going to do with it? I mean, given given her feelings, those feelings aren't going to, it's not like, okay, now that I've got this great plot of land, uh, that's, uh, that. She's not going to go get some rabbits of her own. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I suspect that she'll, she'll take after, maybe she, is she going to go back to, you know, her mother and take her new husband and move out and, and sell the farm? You know, she doesn't want anything to do with it. We don't know. And it's, it's. I get the impression Something. she was not in good relations with her mom, though. Right. Thus, she was with those squatters or, right. or whatever they were to her. It's a strange thing. On the one hand, she leaves her mother, who's, you know, living, a, you know, a, a better life, or at least uh, she's clearly been educated, mm -hmm. you know, while she was away living in, in the city. But but some she had some falling out with her mother clearly. Um, Who, for, for all intents and her... purposes, is her last living relative that we right. know. Right. Right, and and for her to move back to the place where it is very painful for her, that's that's interesting. I mean, that's a, that's a very interesting decision that she made. So, so there's something about the land that that appeals to her, and obviously, you know, she seems to enjoy her her rural existence there with the goats and so forth. But, um, yeah, we 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 don't know how how she turns out. Well, I, I think if she didn't want to be there, she wouldn't have grown yeah. up there doing the goats and right. and in that area itself. If even though she was she was just in the, the in the locality of it all, she could have moved away at any point. She was old enough, right? And then she you know, obviously wanted to be there at some you know in some right. level because of her father. And perhaps, perhaps when she gets the farm, she may feel an attachment to that land to to cultivate it the way her father wanted to, you know, and tried so hard to, she might feel like, okay, now, now it's ours again. And, uh, we're going to, we're going to make good on what my, you know, my, my father wasn't an idiot. He knew what he was doing. You know, he was, he was scheming yeah. and we're going to cultivate this land. We just don't know. And I'm pretty good. sure yeah. she was a daddy's girl. So. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think that's very clear. Yeah. So I, I, I do like, and, and that brings up another thing that we see more, we saw it in the first film and in Jean de Florette, we see it in this and see it probably more in, in French films, at least of, of this era, if, if not uh, other films. But the idea of not tying all the loose ends, not answering all the questions, I like that. I like leaving unresolved issues to the audience to to sort out. And that that seems to be something that at least Hollywood today has is staying away from, with the exception of you know the occasional sort of independent film that sometimes makes it big, you know that that takes more of a you know uh, a, a non Hollywood ending type of approach. But I do like the fact that there are lots of unresolved questions in this film. So you do see less breakout foreign films in the mass market now released right. in theaters you see them at and i mean i see them for work i see quite a lot but in general you don't see them unless you're at film festivals or something right you get you don't get the breakout foreign films like crouching tiger hidden dragon like man mm. and sources anymore mm. as much as you used to yeah fair point good point the last one i can think of would be the untouchables but i don't even know how big that was in america um, have you seen that one, Greg? No, I have not. Uh, it's a it's a good one from 2011. It's a, it's a French film, so you'd probably like that one. Yeah, it's yeah. very good, very good film, and it's been there've been talk. Obviously, because it became a hit straight away, there's talk of a, a an English language mm -hmm. remake. So that's been on the cards, but it hasn't happened yet. The cinematography of this one was was great. Again, did do you know did. I forgot to look this up before we started, but did they film these back to back or was there a break in between? Because it seems pretty much seamless between the two films. They, they must have filmed them in, in sequence. Uh, and I know, I know similar to the way it was released in the U S when it was originally released in France, they were, they were released just three months apart from one another. So um, yeah. And, and I don't, I don't see where, I mean, Yves Montan, this was getting towards the end of his life. Um, I think this was perhaps his last film or certainly one of his last films. And it doesn't seem like 
he aged between them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it even, looks like, go ahead, sorry. I say even the Oogland character was, uh, right. I mean, he was supposed to be about, I, I'm going to assume, let's say 10 years older. Right, right. And uh, he didn't look like he aged no, a day. No, I agree. So they must have been filmed in sequence. Yeah, they were they were filmed back to back. Okay. I'd like to say that I'm shocked that there wasn't a third film, uh, you know, to see what would eventuate. It, it had had, you know, it w- would have been a really successful film in France and then obviously elsewhere around the world. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't, even if there wasn't a book to base it on, that they didn't actually try and cash in on it a bit more by putting a third film and seeing what she did with the farm once she got right, it. Right, yeah, because we're, we're left with, we're left with four four generations of that family, you yeah. know, starting starting with Cesar to the uh, to the baby that uh, you know that that Menno is carrying at the end, and so it, it yeah, as as a family saga, I, I could see worked. it could have worked. Yeah. Well, we know what happens. They 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 sell the land. They sell the land years later to Johnny Depp for. <laughs> Several million dollars. And he makes Chuck a lot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, It also also really surprises me that uh, neither of the two films got Oscar nominated. Like, I just would have thought maybe cinematography or or acting from someone or even screenplay might have got an Oscar nomination, but it, it just won Caesar Awards you know, the French equivalent mm-hmm. to an Oscar and BAFTAs. So more of the European style awards um, than an Oscar. It's just, uh, I actually, until I looked it up, I would have thought it would have been at least nominated. One well, of them. And, but I think part of that is they divided their vote is that the, f- first of all, the American Academy, the, the, you know, motion picture Academy is heavily biased towards American films anyways. But the fact that it did in neither film, Jean de Florida and Man- Manon of the Spring, didn't get nominated was probably due to the fact they came out in the same year. So, yeah. obviously, you know, we all seem to like Jean de Florida more, but Gene Siskel mm-hmm. felt differently. He put it as number four film. And, you know, so people may have liked one film over the other better and divided the vote because they can only have one film from each country. And, yeah, and, true. and so. F- they they had to have picked you know one only one of these films could have come out of there and and I don't know what if there was another film from France that year. Yeah, that should have occurred to me because it would have been a split decision. You're right. I'm looking up to see what would have come out in 1986. Well, Betty Blue, I remember seeing in 86. 1987? I don't think that was nominated. 1987. I'm sorry, is it 87 or 86? It was 87. Well, yeah, 87 in the U.S. Well, au revoir, the infants. Oh. Came out in 87? That's what it says for my list of French films. Well, That's tough competition. Maybe Was that when 80? I don't know. Yeah, 1987, au revoir, les infants. So, and that, if I'm correct, let me double check. Nominated for two Oscars, so there's your French French, French film that got nominated for best pick or best mm-hmm. foreign film that year. Greg, which do you like better? I think I prefer Jean de Florette. Really? But to to Man to Manon, or oh, are you to oh, Au revoir. Oh no, no, Au revoir les enfants, still my my favorite mm-hmm. of those. Yeah, that's I, a that's that a seems power. to be more along the lines of what Oscar likes to nominate. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you get the you get the points for the Holocaust, the Holocaust <laughs> bonus. Yeah, that's true. Um, and plus, it was you know it it was I I don't think Louis Mal took a, my understanding is he did not take a lot of liberties. I mean that it was very much a true story. Um, and so there's that aspect too. I think mm-hmm. you know when it's when it's based on. An, an actual, not just a historical event, but it's not historic, not historical fiction. It was actually, you know, Louis Mal, Louis Mal's experience. So, 
but yeah, these are that's that's some very boy. The French were they were put putting out some good good work that year. My goodness. I think it's just a great year for film in general. Yeah, it was, without a doubt. Yeah, when when uh when we were hearing those titles from and Jean de Floret, uh, you know, of the, the films that came out at the same time. It's just, wow, what a, what a year. Oh, yeah, I got excited when Patrick said, hello again. In the- <laughs> 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 Which wow. were actually okay movies, especially North Shore. <laughs> Guilty pleasure. Well, North Shore is a surfing film. I figure that's in your wheelhouse, but I know how <laughs> huge is. a fan you are of Shelley Long, especially when she dies in a film, so... I think Hello Again was one of about 27 body-swapping films around <laughs> that era. All right, let's go around the table. Greg, what did your what are your final thoughts on this one? Does it stand the test of time? And I, I guess we kind of know the answer to this already, but uh, did you like this as well as or better than Jean de Florette? Yeah, I, I think Jean de Florette is a superior film, but Manon is a, is, a, is a great film. It stands the test of time. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it when I watched it the first time. I enjoyed it again uh, watching it recently. I think it's a again very much in the in the spirit of a of a Greek tragedy and done very well uh, with very good performances and uh, and 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 beautiful filming. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, I I've never been fond of harmonicas, but there was one <laughs> scene that made me rethink that. So my bigotry of against harmonicas was uh, uh, relieved a little bit. You might want to give that scene another try. It gets better the more time <laughs> you do it. <laughs> but yes, it, it, uh, it stands the test of time. Patrick. And so does Emmanuel Bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she does. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I like this film. I, still, I think it does stand the test of time. I liked it back when I first saw it. Uh, it, as much as I don't think it's as strong as Jean de Floret, it is not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination. It just, it, it just is a little bit. It, they had too many storylines overlapping each other, and I think they should have picked a lane and stuck with it. And that's why Jean de Floret is a better film. But this one is by no means a bad film. It is a, a very good film, um, led by a, once again a, a group of strong actors. Uh, Emmanuel Bart is great naked. Uh, there's no complaints about that. Uh, one of the distinct memories of watching these two films when I did was like, what, did I just see what I just thought I saw? I, I got to rewind this for a second. Like, <laughs> it kind of came out of nowhere. Like, wow, I didn't that expect that. was a gold harmonica. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's what I thought. That's a gold <laughs> harmonica. I can't believe that. And it, she's just got it <laughs> laying out there. Gold harmonica right there. I mean, she went full frontal on a gold harmonica. How can you believe that? So. Uh, but in the early nineties, that's not something that you saw in a lot of films unless it, it had porkies in the title. So it was, it, but it was, it was still a very good film dis, despite that. Um, you know, if Matt was here, he'd be discussing the, the female nudity and, in verses and verses, but you know, let's, we will move on. We'll just say she had the gold harmonica. It was there. Uh, but <laughs> it was, I, I enjoy the film. Um, I probably like it a little bit better because Greg kind of commented on Orvar. I like Jean de Florette a little bit better, but because I, I the, the other material is a little heavy, <laughs> so, so it's hard for me to rewatch it. It's a great film, but it's it's kind of like watching Schindler's List. I love Schindler's List. It's a great film. I appreciate it. I've only seen it twice in my life because I don't like to feel that bad all the time. So Jean de Florette's a little bit a little bit lighter to see, even though it has death in it, and there's you know you know, madness and everything like that. It's, it's, it's a little easier to uh, watch on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Manon is a, another classic. It stands the test of time. Uh, I did feel a little depressed throughout this one. So it didn't leave me as uplifted as what Jean de Florette did. I do think Jean de Florette is a better film. And I, I just really can't get over how simplistic the story the cinematography is as well it's just using all the natural beautiful locations to the hilt even the little towns the way they were filming on the street level and that it was just really beautiful to look at uh, and captivating story too uh did go off in a little bit too many tangents this one however it did as already discussed make me want to know what happens next for a third film or uh, that never happened but emmanuel but uh, she can play a gold 
gold harmonica to the hilt. I loved it. <laughs> and uh, it was really just a warm up to her musical Eight Women, where she sang and danced in 2002, which was a good film. I vaguely remember seeing it at the time. And uh, I, I recommend this as a double feature. Like I said, uh, it is all I remember it as at the cinemas, a double feature that played in theatres for over two years back in the day when movies just kept on playing. Uh, and I'm surprised it didn't win any Oscars. Or, But as Patrick said, being two movies, it uh, cancelled itself out, which is very fortunate. Loved it. Really good film. I recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen a foreign film before or wants to relive a classic foreign film. This would be one of the go-to movies as a double feature, though. Well, I agree with all of you. Uh, this film definitely stands the test of time. Uh, not quite as strong as Jean de Florette. I think that, that one, the story uh, captures my attention a little bit more, but still a good one. Um, I haven't seen Au Revoir, Fonts, but that doesn't seem like something that's up my alley. If it's if it's along the lines of lines of Schindler's List, I I probably won't see it, although I'm sure it's an excellent and very well made film as well. But um, definitely stands the test of time, and it it's one that uh, I think no matter how many years pass, it, it it's just going to stay timeless too. So um, yeah, an excellent film. All right, well, that does it for our review of Man and of the Spring. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If you have any review requests for movies from the 80s, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com. Thanks once again for listening to our little podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, information on upcoming podcasts on the MHM Podcast Network, including this one as well as the number two review, Movie House Memories, Mel Bonding, and Sunday Seconds with the Duke. Until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Greg. I'm Patrick. I'm Patrick. And I'm Shane A. Bye for now. We have to get out of here, and you guys are invited. This podcast is not endorsed by MGM Home Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Manon of the Spring, all names and sounds of Manon of the Spring characters or any other Manon of the Spring related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of MGM Home Entertainment or the respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Lunchtime Movie Review, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.